speaker is Joe Wetzels. He will help uh, held a talk on Harry Potter and a not so smart proxy war, taking a look at a covered CIA virtual fencing solution. Enjoy the talk and give a huge round of applause for Joe. Joe's. Sorry. All right. Hello, and everyone. Welcome, everyone, to my talk, Harry Potter and the Not So Smart Proxy War. My name is Jos Wetzels, and I'm a security researcher with Midnight Blue. I primarily focus on embedded systems, uh, mainly in industrial control systems, automotive, and IoT. And I previously worked on the protection of critical infrastructure at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. So, what triggered this talk? Uh, the Vault 7 release of documents. Uh, how many people here are familiar with the Vault 7 documents? All right, that's quite a lot. So this, this concerned almost 9,000 documents belonging to the CIA's Center for Cyber Intelligence, mainly dated between 2013 and 2016. And most of them concerned exploits, implants, and TTPs for various kinds of targets. Now, most of these entries got in-depth coverage by the security community and the press, all except for one, which is the Protego system. So how many people here are familiar with the Protego documents? Yeah, that's, that's almost nobody. And that's kind of the point. So during the release, WikiLeaks claimed that Protego was a suspected assassination module for GPS-guided missile systems, for example, in drones used for uh, assassination, and that it was installed on Pratt & Whitney aircraft. Now, this release consisted of four secret documents and 37 related proprietary manuals. Uh, the project seems to have been maintained between 2014 and 2015. And what's interesting about them is that they're very different from the other projects in the Vault 7 release. There's no clear indication why these documents were in this particular release. Now, when I looked through these documents, something felt off to me. The claim that WikiLeaks put forward did not seem to hold when you look at the documents. Now, this is the architecture at a very high level of, uh, of this Protego system. So on the top, you have the actual Protego subsystem, which consists of a master processor, something they call the tube smart switch, and something they call the missile smart switch. And this communicates over RS-422 with a programming box consisting of two other microcontrollers. And one of the interesting things that you can immediately see is that there is interaction with a GPS beacon interface. So far, so good, right? All the missile systems terminology is there. There's talk of the missiles, there's talk of the tube from which a missile launches, and there's talk of the color that holds it into place. But, number one, this PWA term. So this assertion by WikiLeaks that it was installed on Pratt and, Pratt and Whitney aircraft seems solidly based on the PWA abbreviation in some of these documents. Now, the problem with this is that Pratt and Whitney manufacture engines. They do not manufacture aircraft. And it doesn't really make sense for these microcontrollers that are part of Protego uh, to reside on the engine. So I was thinking, what could this PWA stand for? And I think a much more likely explanation is that it stands for printed wiring assembly, which is essentially a PCB after all the components are attached. And that seems to me like a more sensible explanation for this term. And then there's the second kind of complication, which is also a giveaway for what I think that Protego is actually about. There's mention of a suitcase, there's mention of a BCU, and a grip stock. So how many people here are familiar with the terminology of BCU and grip stock? Right, that's not a lot of people. Now, this is not typical air-to-surface or air-to-air -air missile terminology. So I have an alternative hypothesis. And that's that Protego is a MANPAD smart arms control solution. So for those who don't know, MANPADs, uh, like Stinger missiles, are shoulder portable systems that can be used to take down various advanced aircrafts. And this is essentially how they work. Like at the base, they have a launch tube. Uh, and the missiles are typically delivered in a discardable launch tube, which after the, uh, the launch, you throw away. And that includes the side assembly. And these tubes can be reused, um, but that's usually done at the depot, not on the battlefield. And they're transported in a dedicated case, which seems to match this suitcase terminology that we saw earlier. And then the missiles themselves look roughly something like this. So at the front, you have a seeker head, uh, which typically works by uh, infrared. And that allows for passive homing. Uh, it takes a, a, an IR signature of the target and then locks onto it. 
And then you have the guidance and control steer section, which essentially steers the, uh, uh, the missile during its flight towards the target. And then you have a warhead, which is the thing that goes boom. And then you have this grip stock terminology that we saw. So in manpads, um, you get the missile, which is a one-time use thing, typically. Um, and, but the grip stock is something that is reusable between missiles. And that is detachable. It contains the trigger, uh, which you use to fire the missile. And it contains the targeting electronics. Uh, so they essentially get the signal from the uh, seeker head. It's rerouted to the targeting electronics in the grip stock, and then makes all the kind of complicated calculations and sends that data back to the missile before firing it. Um, and this is also where you insert the BCU, which is the terminology that we saw earlier, which is a term that stands for battery coolant unit. So it's a canister filled with something like liquid argon, which shoots a jet into the system for both power and cooling purposes. And the launch procedure looks something like this, like you can picture on the right. Uh, you attach the grip stock and maybe an identify friend or foe system uh, to the launch tube. You use the site to track the aircraft. Then you get audio feedback from the identify friend or foe to see if, if maybe it's a friendly aircraft and you don't want to fire on it. Then if you've decided that the aircraft should be taken down, you insert the BCU and you get audio feedback from the grip stock as soon as you have a target lock on and you pull the trigger. And that's essentially very roughly how these kind of systems work. And I think this matches the kind of terminology in the Protego documents much better than a system that's installed on, uh, on drones. Now, the core of what Protego does, you can see on the left here. Um, it essentially limits the operational conditions uh, for ensuring system operationability to a conjunction between the three situations that we see on the left. It needs to be within border, the GPS signal needs to be valid, and the operational period might not, uh, must not have expired. So what this essentially is, is a geofencing solution. So people who are not familiar with geofencing, that's essentially uh, any kind of system that restricts the usage of a particular system to a particular time and a particular place. Why would the CIA want something like this? And I, I must add that this is obviously speculation based on very few documents, but I do think it is a more plausible hypothesis than the one that is, that is currently out there. Well, if you've been following the news a little bit, especially around the, uh, uh, the terrible Syrian situation, after the, the, uh, the situation deteriorated, many of the rebels started facing serious uh, air power, both by the Syrian uh, air army as well as by Russian allies. Because the US has a vested interest in opposing uh, the Assad regime, and the Russians have a vested interest in uh, supporting it, a situation emerged where voices started calling for maybe supplying these rebel forces with manpads to counter this kind of air power. Now, this does come with some problems, especially if you're aware of the history of supplying manpads to what I'd like to call less than trusted third parties. Man on the right went on to become very famous. Um, so during the end of the Cold War, the, uh, the Americans, they sent Stinger missiles to the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan to counter Soviet air power. Um, that did end up working, but the problem is that you then had the proliferation of this kind of powerful technology among parties that went on to be not exactly allies. So people started um, talking about maybe implementing technical use controls in these kind of systems, using GPS, for example, to limit uh, the use of these, these Stinger missiles to a particular time and place to counter proliferation. I think the most sensible candidate for something like this to have been developed is what came to be known as the Timber Sycamore program. So Timber Sycamore was a CIA program uh, to supply Syrian rebels with weapons and training from 2012 to 2017. Um, supposedly, in, in all the official communication that followed after its disclosure, uh, manpads were barred from the program. But there have been sources that claim that small batches of manpads have made it uh, to rebel hands in Syria. Now, I have to say it is unclear to me whether Protego was a part of this program, whether it was even fielded. Maybe it was just developed and never actually fielded. But I do think this is a very good candidate for the kind of technology that you can see on those, uh, those documents. So what's the Harry Potter connection? Well, it's mainly in the name. Uh, and the name is another giveaway for the functionality of the system. 
So within these documents, two names come forward from Harry Potter, uh, the Devil Snare name and Protego. And essentially, Protego is a charm that protects the caster with a, a shield spell. And the Devil Snare is a magical plant that constrains someone to a certain position. You know, nice metaphor for a geofence. So let's take a look at a little bit of uh, technical analysis to delve into that. This is the, uh, the actual block diagram from the, uh, the documents. So if anyone with clearance is in the room, sorry. Um, there's three main microcontrollers there. Uh, the main processor on the left, the tube smart switch in the middle, and uh, the missile smart switch on the right, which are all uh, PIC 16-bit uh, microcontrollers. Uh, I put some additional terms on there, like AT, which stands for anti-tamper, IB, which stands for in-border, EOM, which stands for end of mission, and then there's talk of the Sigma dot, which is uh, missile's terminology for a tracking signal. Now, this is the heart of the smart fence and how it works. So the way this, these, these man pads work is that the missile, after the seeker head has found a potential target, sends the sigma dot signal over a wire to the grip stock, where the actual calculations need to be done by the targeting electronics. So what the smart fence mechanism does is it ensures that this switch is default open, so no signal goes from the missile seeker to the grip stock, unless certain conditions are met. And that's the whole, the whole core of the system. It closes only uh, after these conditions have been met and otherwise uh, not. So how does that work? Uh, you can see this on this, this sequence chart. Uh, after the conditions have been met, after the BCU has been inserted, it sends an encrypted signal to the tube smart switch to say, set audio switch on, which is terminology for close this smart switch. Uh, and it then forwards it to the missile smart switch, which ensures operationability. And the protection of the system relies on the fact that these channels for these communications, which is an internal serial bus, are encrypted, and as such require the presence of keys, which is why they included key erasure functionality. So when do these keys get erased? Um, after you enter the border once, so you go to the target where you uh, uh, want to deploy your system and you enter this, this geofence border, um, then the keys get erased if you ha detect an anti-tampering event, uh, you detect low batteries, uh, or if you go out of the border or the mission ends. And then the main processor key, as well as the tube smart switch keys, are both uh, uh, erased. They're also erased if a missing missile is detected, so if you remove the missile from the tube. So these are the status indication LEDs, and I think these, these would be mounted on the suitcase, and they indicate the status in which the missile uh, is in. Why is this probably there? Uh, because operators need to know the system is good to go before running up to an aircraft and then figuring out, oh, it, it doesn't work. Too bad. Um, this is the message format. It's not terribly important, but this is sent over the serial buses. And the inner core of the message, which is 1 to 8 bits, is, uh, is encrypted. Um, unencrypted messages are allowed, but only for one message type. Uh, and that's the case if the nonce is set to 0. So these are the messages that are sent between this programming box and the Protego subsystem. And the only interesting ones, in my opinion, are the ones that allow you to reprogram uh, the main processor or change the, uh, the beacon state configuration or enter tactical mode. And these are the messages that are sent internally between the microcontrollers, uh, closing the audio relay, detecting anti-tampering, missile missing, that kind of stuff. So let's do a brief security analysis. Um, I have to, to say that this is, again, hypothetical, because the CAA did not provide me with any missiles. So I'm going to be uh, talking at a very high level. But this is the general attack plan that I would imagine people attacking these kind of systems going through. Hypothetically, this is what the Protego life cycle looks like. So you start by programming the device uh, uh, with key material, uh, which is loaded into the firmware images. Uh, you switch it to storage mode. Then you ship it to a covert facility in or near the, uh, the theater of operations. Uh, the programming box, which I imagine to be handled by a CAA officer, is then used to configure the geo and the time fence, uh, which is requested by, by this less than trusted third party. Um, it enables tactical mode. You hand it over to these guys. And then if it is stolen, uh, it's rendered inoperable outside of defense conditions. Or if the mission period expires without use, you return it to the facility and you can set it again for another go. And this is the cryptographic architecture underpinning it. And you can really make up a lot of this uh, out of the documents. So the keys are generated using a keygen uh, uh, application. They're written into the firmware images. 
the programming box itself does not contain any keys. Uh, maybe it queries them from some kind of a backend. Maybe they're entered using some kind of a key loading device. It's unclear to me. Uh, the keys that are loaded into the Protego system uh, consist of a one uh, single one to eight bit key, uh, which is shared between all the microcontrollers on this uh, uh, man pads. Uh, the missile smart switch key never actually does get erased. Um, and interestingly, there is one maintenance key. So they mentioned that there is a maintenance key that's embedded in the firmware images, which is identical for all the Protego instances. So not just one man pads, but all the missiles. And why is this the case? Well, I think that if you have an uh, event which erases the keys, for example, the expiry of the mission period, then you still need to be able to reconfigure a new mission period. And if there's no keys, you cannot communicate over this programming interface. So there's probably a maintenance key that exists as a fallback that if the actual mission key is no longer there, you can still reconfigure this new uh, situation. But from a security point of view, having a global maintenance key uh, among all these, these man pads is not a uh, uh, good idea, in my opinion. So what does the attack surface look like? It looks like something like this. You might go for attacking the GPS. You might go for physical tampering. You might try to extract or modify the keys or the, uh, the system logic. So if we were to go for physical tampering, these would be the most likely candidates, uh, in my opinion. You might try to mess with the beacon interface signals or try to cause a default true evaluation regarding of the, uh, the actual fence. Uh, conditions, or you might try to target with the, swen the smart switch itself by ensuring that it's normally closed, regardless of the fence conditions. Now, in these kind of systems, there's bound to be anti-temper measures, obviously. Uh, so these might consist of things like metal shielding, or they might consist of encapsulation into coatings that are resistant to, to tempering or might cause damage to the components if you try to remove it. There might be light sensors, so as soon as you open up the device, you know, it triggers an anti-tempering event, or as soon as you apply a certain kind of pressure to the, the PCB, it might ensure that the keys are erased. And there might be active meshes there, which is essentially a grid of very uh, uh, thin wires that as soon as you break them or you short them, cause an anti-tempering event. And these might be, exist at an uh, IC level, but they might also exist at an uh, enclosure level, or they might be woven through the encapsulation um, to make things even worse. Now, there's many well-explored invasion techniques, uh, and also via the IC backside, which I will not explore in this talk. But I think one of the most interesting things here is that the keys are stored in flash and not in battery-backed SRAM. And that's interesting because if an attacker can bypass enough anti-tempering measures to be able to cut the right enable line to the flash, they might at a later point be able to prevent erasure if the keys are, are uh, stored there. Um, the issue for an attacker here is that these kind of methods are quite knowledge and capital intensive, and you're also working on a system with an active warhead in there, so that, that's probably nerve-wracking. The bigger issue, in my opinion, is that the seeker signals might be unencrypted. And if they're unencrypted, that would mean that even if I open up the device and I ensure that the smart switch is default closed and the keys are erased, then it might be possible for the, the seeker to still get a lock on and get the firing signal from the grip stock. So I'm not sure if this is the case, but if they are unencrypted, that, that would not be uh, very good. So I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how hard tampering with that switch is. It's just speculation. But there's nothing indicating that these signals are uh, encrypted as well. Then there's the, the route of going logical tampering. So we want to bypass the fence. And in this rough attack tree, you can see that we can either try to change the fence parameters, we can try to reprogram the uh, main processor firmware, or we can try to attack the GPS. So let's try to explore what's involved here. Now, in both cases, we will need to first understand the protocol, because, well, we understand it from the leaked documents, but in an ideal situation, an attacker would not. So we would have to reverse engineer the firmware, which we would have to be able to extract either from the Protego system itself or maybe from the programming box, but that's not very likely because then we would have to steal it from a CEA officer. Uh, the same goes for, for obtaining the keys, which you would either have to extract from the microcontrollers or, again, the programming box. Now, I think that the conclusion here is that most of these approaches will likely require you to sacrifice at least one man pads for research and then try to generalize it to other man pads that might be in your possession. So when trying to extract or modify the keys and firmware, there's four main approaches. 
Now, you can go for the debugging interfaces. You can go for side channel analysis. You can go for invasive attacks. Or you can go for exploiting software bugs. Now, some of these approaches might trigger anti-tampering measures, but the maintenance key never gets erased. And it's global. So if I'm capable of extracting this, that's a very interesting route to go down. Um, these are the debugging interfaces for the microcontrollers that are used in Protego. Uh, it's the, the PIC 16-bit, which uses in-circuit serial programming. And you can use that to read or write to internal memory. Now, there is an issue. Uh, microchip does have CodeGuard, which is its own readout and write protection. This is configured via uh, fuses um, in the, uh, uh, the microcontroller. And a violation of its policies will trigger a security reset. And it offers three levels of segmentation. You have the boot segment, uh, where you have your secure bootloader. Then you have the secure segment, where you can put secure IS errors or small lookup tables or something like that. And then you have the general segment for all the rest. And the privileges go from high to low there. Now, this is the memory layout of the Protego microcontrollers. You have the, uh, the firmware in the executable flash. And that's essentially checked with a version number and a 16-bit CRC uh, during startup. Uh, after that, you have the key and uh, the key number, uh, which is also checked with a checksum, which is also CRC. And what's really interesting to me is that there's no mention of firmware authentication whatsoever here. There's no mention of a hardware root of trust or a secure element. There's really nothing beyond CodeGuard. That's, that's the core protection here. An interesting disclaimer from Microchip is that Regarding CodeGuard, there are dishonest and possibly illegal methods used to breach the code protection feature. Imagine that. All of these methods, to our knowledge, require using the microchip products in a manner outside the operating specifications contained in microchip's data sheets. Most likely, the person doing so is engaged in the theft of intellectual property. Well, that's very confidence-inspiring. Um, so the microcontrollers that are used in Protego only offer CodeGuard Basic, which only supports a single general segment for read and write protection. So there's no separate segment for bootloaders or keys or whatsoever. I didn't delve into CodeGuard uh, security uh, um, in depth uh, for the newer uh, microcontrollers of PIC because I didn't have the time for that. But interestingly, older families' uh, code protection suffered from what they called the heart of darkness attack. And what you basically did here is that you could erase the, uh, the memory on a per block basis, and that would reset the security settings only for that block. So for the first block, uh, the boot block, you would override it with a dumper. And upon execution, that would dump the rest of the microcontroller memory. And then you would, at a later stage, override one of the other blocks uh, in another known good, and then dump the boot block that way. And you would be able to extract it. I'm not sure if that applies to these microcontrollers as well, but uh, might be an interesting avenue uh, of approach. Another way to try and obtain the keys would be using side channel attacks. Um, I'm not going very in depth here. I'm assuming people are familiar with simple differential and, and correlation power analysis. Um, interestingly, for the, for the PIC microcontrollers, uh, the ones that they chose here, is there is no hardware crypto, and there's no uh, hardware-based side channel uh, uh, countermeasures there. There's probably, in my opinion, also no software countermeasures, like blinding and masking or anything like that, because they might affect power consumption in an adverse manner. Um, and that's, that's an issue for Protego, because there are extreme power constraints here, because you only draw power from the BCU or a battery that is in the grip stock. Um, and in this case, you would target the maintenance key, extract it, and then apply it again to a different man pads. Invasive attacks would be another route. Uh, the PIC microcontroller families, uh, I believe 12 and 18, suffered from an attack where if you decap them down to the die level and you shown UV light on the uh, floating gate, you would be able to reset the security fuses and quite reliably because the fuses were quite far away from uh, the rest of, uh, of internal memory. And this apparently applies as well to the PIC24s. I've never seen a public write-up. But when Googling this, there was a Chinese company offering the capability to, to bypass readout protection on these microcontrollers. And I, I believe that that would probably be an approach like this. So if that applies, that's quite serious. Then there's the route of software vulnerabilities um, that would be using a memory corruption bug or a state machine logic bug in order to either exfiltrate the cryptographic keys or maybe try to cause a, a send switch close message while it should not be sent. Um, there's very little to say about how applicable this is. 
but there are software change requests with leaked documents, and they mention things like when BCU power is applied and the missing missile is active, the erase does not occur. Now, they caught stuff like this, but if bugs like that slipped into production, attackers might be able to exploit it. I don't think this is a very viable approach for the kind of attackers that, that would be going after this, because the attack surface that is exposed on, on a software level is very minimal, and doing any kind of, of full black box vulnerability research or exploit development here is, is hellish. So you would need to be able to extract the firmware anyway. So I don't think this is a very viable route. What's more viable, in my opinion, is attacking GPS, because the core security decision of Protego is based on GPS-derived info, location, and time. Now, for those unfamiliar with GPS, a little bit of a 101, GPS is part of, of a set of systems known as GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite System. There's also a Russian GLONASS, uh, the European Galileo, and the Chinese Baidu. Uh, Protego in my opinion, probably uses the plain course acquisition codes, uh, because in GPS you have five bands, and uh, the L1 and the L2 band consist of a course acquisition civilian code and an encrypted precision code for military systems. I don't think Protego uses that, because that would mean that the system needs access to these military cryptographic keys, and you don't want that in a system like this, because it needs to be handed out to um, a less than trusted third party, and it also does not aid plausible deniability. So that means it uses plain signals. Threat number one here would be GPS jamming, because if the GPS is unavailable, maybe key erasure does not occur. Or even worse for the people using these missiles, if the GPS is unavailable, the man pads won't fire, which is quite interesting for, for opposing air forces here. Now, a naive approach would be to use just overpowering noise on the L1 and the L2 bands. Um, but this might be detected through signal anomalies, uh, or it might be corrected for. Uh, for example, through using multi-source correlation from different GNSS session, uh, systems, using noise filtering, stuff like that. And that might trigger key erasure. So instead, you might want to go for a smart uh, GPS jamming approach, where you combine your jammer with info from uh, the GNSS system. And then you trigger short and spart bursts, which are aligned with specific portions of the message, such as the preamble, the time mark, or the uh, CRC. And that's far harder to detect. Another approach to attacking GPS would be using spoofing, uh, because GPS is an unauthenticated and weak signal, which allows for replay or forging. And that's become much easier over the years uh, through commercial and SDR solutions. Um, so you would collect an infant signal, move the man pads to a Faraday cage, and then uh, continue replaying it in a loop. Now, again, there could be countermeasures here, such as detecting anomalies in signal strength, latency, loss of lock, uh, using multi-source correlation, or using an internal reference clock uh, to detect uh, jumps in time. I do think there is an issue with implementing stuff like this in Protego, because active countermeasures would, again, drain power here. So an attacker that, that, that uh, would try to bypass stuff like this would try to use a carry-off attack, where you try to uh, carefully align the spoofed signal and gradually increase the power over time uh, to take over the signal without uh, causing a loss of lock or uh, triggering these countermeasures. So it's not um, unovercomable. Conclusion. This does not only apply to Protego. Everything I said is essentially Embedded System Security 101. This applies to all kinds of geofencing solutions, like theft prevention in armored trucks, ankle monitors, UAV area denial, and livestock management. So you might in the future see cyberpunk cattle rustlers using technology like this. <laughs> is any of this stuff attacked in practice? Well, yes, especially through GPS jamming, because it's very accessible. You don't need a lot of technological knowledge. You spend 10 bucks on, on AliExpress, and you buy a jammer, and then you use it, uh, for example, as a car thief or a cargo thief, which does happen. And in conclusion, Protego, I don't think it is a GPS-guided aircraft assassination module. Uh, I think it is a manpads geofencing solution for a covert arms supply program. It's unclear to me where, when, or if it was ever fielded. Uh, Timber Sycamore would have been a good candidate. And interestingly, it utilizes commercial off-the-shelf technology in a similar fashion to commercial systems. A geofence is a geofence. And possible Achilles heels here would be the unencrypted seeker signals, a lack of secure boot and firmware authentication, the existence of a global maintenance key, and its reliance on civilian GPS without any clear electronic warfare countermeasures. 
And that's it. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or ask them over Twitter. Thank you very much. You all know the uh, procedure. We have eight microphones in the room, so please line up behind the microphone. Or also, you can ask questions on the internet, and uh, our awesome signal angels will relay the questions into the hall. Right now, we have one question at microphone number four. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, when the, the device uses the military uh, version of GPS, is uh, GPS spoofing then still possible? Um, I'm not sure about it because I haven't looked really into the details of like the precision uh, uh, codes. I have read articles that it would still be possible in some scenarios the, because of the, the way key management happens there, but I can't really answer that question in detail because I haven't really investigated that. All right, we have another question at microphone number two over there, please. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, uh, you talked about GPS spoofing to keep the system working. It seems like there's a very practical attack where you could disable the man pads by spoofing GPS and pretending to be outside the fence when it's actually still inside. Yeah, yeah, that's, I, I think like if, if the attacker model is not a less than trusted third party trying to take these man pads and you know, use them against civilian airliners, but instead, from the perspective of the man pads user, the adversary would be a opposing air force, then using simple GPS jamming would be sufficient to ensure that these cannot fire, which in my opinion is a little bit iffy because GPS jamming is, is not that, that hard. All right, another question at microphone number four. Go ahead, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I actually have two questions. So first is um, like, okay, well, you found the documents. So actually, what motivated you to do all of this research? You know, like it's a lot of work. Like the documents which you found, analysis which you've done, and you're a very busy person. So <laughs> it's a lot of work. That's question number one. And question number two is all of these designs which you've been showing, like. Um, key management, certain security decisions, design of this, like, of the electronics, how does it compare to you to all the industrial equipment you looked at? Did you see what is more smarter, more intelligence, more, is it better than in the industry or not? So with regards to the first question, it's, um, I think, curiosity and using the little spare time you have to somehow still sit behind a PC. Um, that, that, that's the main answer, to be honest. Um, and the second answer is, um, well, I can't really say a lot about how it compares because there is a degree of speculation in this research. Like, I have looked at the documents and I can extrapolate from the security features that I know the microcontrollers to have and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's hard to compare uh, definitively. Uh, but I would say that, that the interesting thing is that the microcontrollers used are not secure microcontrollers. They do not have a secure element. They are not intended for high security purposes. And I'm not sure why they chose these. Maybe it's because this was only during a development phase. Uh, maybe it was because of the, the power consumption constraints. But it would not be my first choice. So I would say, yeah, it, 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 it compares badly uh, in a sense. All right, we have a question from the internet. Go ahead, Signal Angel. Do the rebels in these conflicts have reasonable access to the resources needed to crack the system? No, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that. Would the less trusted parties have resources to crack something like this? <laughs> well, they would have now. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think that's, 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 that's the problem. Like, to be honest, these less than trusted third parties, like these are not stupid people. Like they don't, I don't think these are people who have the kind of resources for doing really invasive attacks with focused ion beams and God knows what. But GPS spoofing and GPS jamming are not complicated attacks. They're relatively easy to figure out. And as soon as you know this is a system that works on the basis of GPS, which is not hard to figure out, you can try to develop an attack like that. So I think even without these leaks, um, 
fielding a system like this is, is I, I don't think, a very good solution to, to that proliferation question. So I, I think getting around this, this kind of stuff, if it works, like the documents seem to, to hint uh, that it works, um, yeah, they, they, they could probably get around it. All right, Signal Angel, do you have anything else from the internet? Nope. Okay, then thank you very much for this great talk, Joseph Wetzels.